I, I've been asked a couple of times while we've gone through some of these things we talked about last couple of weeks about some of the uh, things with the nation Israel being a, a, a standard of nation building. That's a term that, that's come into our vocabulary in the last few years uh, in some of our country's foreign policies, going into countries, invading the countries, turning over the government, and trying to build nations. We did that successfully after World War II in Japan and, and Germany and the, some of the Axis powers. And it was interesting back in the 1980s when, when Japan and Germany were the two strongest nations in the world economically. Actually, you know, they, they, there were two nations that we had actually uh, defeated in World War II and then rebuilt their economies and cultures for them. And, and it was kind of, kind of one of those uh, things where people said, well, wow, what's, what's going on? We rebuilt them, and here they are taking over from us. Of course, they, they, they didn't, but uh, that, that's successful nation building. Most of the time, it doesn't work. Our country is a, is a republic, not an empire. And we don't function well when we try to be an empire. And one of the problems that we've had in the last 20, 30 years, uh, actually since 9-11, it's been an active problem, but it goes all the way back to the Nixon administration, where we've tried to function as an empire, and it doesn't work. We've got, we've got troops. I, I was in back in the, in the 90s, uh, Oscar Woodall and I would tra were traveling into uh, Eastern Europe, Bulgaria, Macedonia, that part of the world that w was former communist countries, and we were eating supper with some folks in, in, in Macedonia, and the man mentioned that, that there are 10,000 American troops in Macedonia. And I said, what? What in the tarnation are, are American troops doing in Macedonia? And he began to explain to me how that, uh, they, it kept the, the Greeks and the Turks from fighting for Macedonia to have American troops. And I'm thinking, whoa, <laughs> if I had a kid in the army and, and he's a buffer between the Greeks and the, and the Turks fighting over Macedonia, I don't think I'd be very happy. But that, that's, that's sort of the foreign policy of the country has been that way for some time. It's kind of under the radar, but uh, we support the nation's uh, economies of many uh, nations, prosperous and otherwise, by the presence of our military. And, and a guy wrote a book years ago uh, called A Nation, uh, a Republic, Not an Empire. So nation building is not something that, it doesn't work so well. But when you, when you think about building a nation, if you wanted to build a nation God's way, you'd look at the nation Israel because God built a nation. And he took the nation Israel, put them in the, in, in the earth and said, here's my nation. This is what a nation, is how a nation is governed and how it runs when I created. And had Israel been the nation that God created them to be, one day they will be that righteous nation and they'll set up his kingdom, his government in, in the earth. And, and so when we, we talked about that the last couple of weeks in regard to some economic things and, and some liberty things. Uh, try to say to you, and I've had some discussion with people, how do you define liberty? And I, I think one of the, the best definition of liberty that I ever read or heard is the, the right to say no. You know, you, you think about liberty as a freedom to do this, freedom to do that, do that. Say, really, it's a negative thing. I talked to you last week about the reason that the Ten Commandments, nine of the Ten Commandments are negative. Uh, is because that's the most powerful way to say something. And real true liberty is the, is the right to say no. Now that means, what, okay, then what is a right? A right is a grant of privilege uh, that's not going to be obstructed by governmental intervention or anyone else. I have, this, I have a grant of privilege to do something. And when we talk about rights, that's what a right is. And the, the right... The grant of privilege to say no is what real, true liberty really is. That's one of the reasons people are fighting right now against some of these mandates by various government officials to tell you you can't do this and you can't do the other thing. You have to do this, you have to do the other. I want the liberty to say no. And when I can't say no without governmental uh, coercion, I've lost a liberty. So when you think about those things, the question comes up, especially in regard to what's going on now with the COVID-19 uh, now the stay at home stuff shelter, shelter I, I'm sorry I'm six weeks into it and I still can't remember when I need to if, if I'm sitting at home at my desk I can remember it when I stand here I can't remember shelter at home mandates 
and, and, and decrees, and now that they're beginning to kind of in some places, you know, uh, ease up on some of those things. Uh, the federal guidelines about when, they, when you have uh, decreasing new case numbers for two weeks, then you can start doing that. Our state isn't that way yet, and uh, probably won't be for a while because we have Chicago to deal with. But in all of the discussion about the shelter in place and those kind of things that are, that are mandated, by the way, a quarantine is when you tell sick people they can't go out of the house. Uh, when you tell well people they can't go out, that's not a quarantine. That's tyranny. So there's a little bit of difference to that, but we use terms loosely. But people, I, people ask about it. I've had several people ask me about, what about the new world order and the globalism that all this is, uh, is bringing about? If there's anything that is being challenged today, it's what in our system of government is called federalism. And most people today have no idea what federalism is. You, you have three or four generations who've been raised in government schools that don't teach uh, the basic civics of our country and so forth, the, the, the philosophies behind things. You couldn't find one out of 20 graduates from high school in a government school around this area could explain to you why there's a, a, uh, a college of cardinals. College of cardinals. Now I'm a, now I'm a Catholic. <laughs> How do we elect a president? <laughs> Electoral college. My mind is off. My, my, my mind is off in the parking lot tonight. I'm, I'm sorry. An electoral college. Why would why would our constitution have an indirect electing of president through a, through a cardinal uh, cardinal? I'm gonna sit down and start again. Okay, here we go. All right, a, an electoral college. Well, there's there's a real concept of protecting the minority against the tyranny of the majority. And that's why that's there. And if you know anything about our history, you understand why that's there, why it's a very important fail-safe. You hear people all the time saying, we need term limits on, on Congress. You have, on your congressman, you have a term limit every two years. You have to get reelected. Senators, it's every six years. You have term limits. The danger of term limits it's not that the guy can't get reelected. I mean, if you don't want him elected, go out and campaign against him and get him unelected. The danger in term limits is if, if somebody's there for, you elect somebody and he's there for six, eight, ten years, then who runs the government? The deep state. So the deep state, the people, the, the staff that's always there, they begin to run things. They run things enough as it is. You don't need to institutionalize it. So people have all these these catchphrase answers for things that really don't understand the fundamental way our government is designed to operate. And one of the things is federalism. There have been two, I believe now, two great assaults on federalism. The first was the Civil War. When, when you think about the Civil War, President Lincoln, right? Now, let me be sure I get this right. <laughs> Land of Lincoln here. His, his whole approach, his whole goal was to preserve the union, that the states didn't have right of self-determinism to succeed. But we have to preserve the union, even if it's against the will of a state. So we're going to preserve the union. That's the opposite of federalism. This COVID-19 is an assault on federalism on the rights of states to be self-determined. Now, President Trump, perhaps to get himself out of a jam, but he's done the right thing. He said, you know, here are the federal guidelines, but the states have to decide what they're going to do. Our, our governor, just this past week, getting pressure because you have two Illinois. You have Chicago, about 9 million people, and then about 3 million people in the rest of the state. And so you say, well, how come some county down central and southern Illinois has to be treated like Chicago when they might have two cases and so, uh, of uh, virus, some none? And he's begun to say, well, we can function regionally within the state. That's a, that's a good thing. That's, a, that's the way our government is designed, bottom up, not top down. 
And someone told me, said, well, I think that this stuff's going to be uh, the death of globalism. And not a chance. Not a chance. Every time the government gets a, time, a chance with a crisis, oh, somebody help us protect us. Let, you know, let the big piggy bank in the sky come and, and protect us. They take over. And they never forget how quickly and easily it is to do it. Now, you've got dress rehearsals. Can I tell you that what's going on right now is not... I'm, I'm, settle some of your fears. You've got Genesis 11. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2. What's going on right now is not going to be the new world order. Will there be a new world order? Absolutely, yes. The new world order is going to be the fruition of what starts in Genesis 11. It goes all the way to Revelation 17. And there absolutely will be a one world government, a one world economy, a one world religion. Globalism is going to win for a time. But it isn't going to win anytime soon. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The, son, the man of sin, the son of perdition, that's the Antichrist. <coughs> Excuse me. That's the two phases of his career in the seventh week of Daniel. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So you have this falling away. The man of sin is going to be revealed, the son of perdition. He's going to go in and set himself up. We're talking about the, we got the character we call the Antichrist. Now verse 5, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. So Paul explained these things to them when he was there. That's why in 1 Thessalonians 5, he tells you, you don't need me to tell you. You understand the times and the seasons. Perfect. You understand the prophetic program because I taught it to you. Verse 6, and now you know. So they understand this. What withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time? For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The long and the short of that is the he who now letteth will let is the Holy Spirit in the church, the body of Christ. What's restraining and holding back the mystery of iniquity, what's holding back the revelation of the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, what's holding back prophecy is that God has interrupted the prophetic program. He's holding back that globalism that will come with the Antichrist in order to extend the day of grace another day. And as long as the dispensation of grace is in, is in effect and the body of Christ is being formed and operating, that program is being withheld. Now, that means that the ultimate new world order that people fear so much isn't going to materialize while we're here. That doesn't mean there can't be some stage-setting events. Come with me to Romans chapter 8. I'm willing to believe, just like many people are proclaiming, that what's going on with the COVID-19 and what's going on with the pandemic and what's going on with the fear and hysteria and all that kind of stuff, the, the government actions and so forth, that what's going on with that is a stage-setting event. It's a trial run. It's getting people, maybe not your age and my age, but somebody that's young. I don't know if you're 20 years old or you're 15 years old, and you're seeing what's going on, and this is your normal, not a new normal, but the normal life for you, then when you're 30 and somebody comes along and extends it, it won't be a big deal. So what you have is a, it's sort of the, 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 the dress rehearsal kind of thing, the stage setting, the getting people accustomed to it kind of thing. And people, it, this has been happening since, since, uh, since forever. Romans chapter number 8, here's an interesting passage, verse number 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Isn't it wonderful to know nothing can? Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. That's so wonderful to know that. The CNS gang can beat on you all day long. Circumstances, situations can whack on you, have drive-by shootings, whatever, but they can't separate you from the love of Christ. 
verse number 39, at the end of it, he says, nothing should be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. God put his love in his son. God commended his love towards you and that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you and you're in Christ and nothing can separate you from that. Nothing can take you away. Nothing can diminish God's value and esteem for you. But look back at verse 35. Question, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril of sword, can any of those things separate you? No. But think about that. Those are things that are going to happen in your life. Tribulation, problems, pressure, trouble, difficulties, they're going to come. Distress, you're going to have moments where you seem like you feel like you're pressed beyond measure. Persecution. We live in a day when people, if somebody looks at you crossways, you feel persecuted. If somebody says a harsh word to you, you feel persecuted. <laughs> Go back and read, read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 where Paul I'm in perils of the wilderness, perils of robbers, peril of my own countrymen. He knew what being in peril was really about, being shipwrecked night and day. In, in, in the, that's real trouble. That's real difficulties. You get in those situations and, you know, your heart wonders, well, did God forget about me? Where is his? Nothing separates from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Now keep reading. Famine. It's fascinating. Last week they, it got into the news. It's been, you've been aware of this for several weeks, but it got news play last week that they've closed down some meatpacking places. And just like when this stuff started, there was a run on toilet paper. Now there's a run on meat. <laughs> My wife was at the store Saturday, and she said there's no meat, no beef, Almost no pork and just a little bit of chicken. And so, <laughs> okay, famine. Can't get enough to eat. Paul said, I know what's to be hungry. I know what it's not to have a freezer full of food. Nakedness, peril. The one I want you to see is that next one, sword. You know what the sword is? That's the government. Do you understand there can be a time in your life, my life, when the government can persecute you. What did Paul, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. That's government persecution. He said, I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even under bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Be not ashamed of our, the, the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Paul had the reputation of being a jailbird. If he got pulled over for, for speeding and they ran his record, he's got a rap sheet. The government persecuting him. The government con confining him. He had to finally appeal to the Supreme Court of Rome just to get his freedom. And then it didn't work for long. If the government begins to assault us, it won't be anything that hasn't happened to Saints for 2,000 years. It won't be a great, unusual kind of thing. And it's not something that's going to separate us from who God has called us to be in Jesus Christ as his ambassadors. Now, I don't recommend, you know, I'm, I, I don't mean to, that, that you ought to give up and just lay down. You just need to understand that persecution like that, difficulties, even from Gover the government is not going to stop. It's not going to change. You're not going to change the world system. We live in this present evil world. Our job isn't to change the political structure. Our job isn't to change the economic structure. Our job isn't to change the social structure. You can go out and be a social water warrior, an economic warrior, a political warrior, warrior, and if you won every battle you fought... In 10 years, nobody would remember you or what you were fighting for. And it'd all be gone. Because the permanent structures to change all of that won't take place until Jesus Christ comes back. I've said many times, 
When we say we are premillennial Bible believers, that is as much a political, economic, and social statement as it is a theological statement. Because we're saying that this present evil world isn't going to be set right until Jesus Christ comes and sets it right himself. When Isaiah 33 is right, when he's our king, he's our lawgiver, and he's our judge, when all the branches of the government are under his control directly, that's when it gets settled. So the idea of globalism isn't something that's going to go away anytime soon. It isn't going to succeed either, but it's not going to go away, and it's going to be something that we fight and push against by the preaching of the gospel. Now, it all starts back in Genesis 11, so I want to go back there with you and look at Genesis 11 just for a little bit, because what globalism is, is the satanic counterattack on the way God designed the world to be established, and that is through nationalism. If you go back with me to Genesis chapter number 11, when God established nations in the earth, it takes place in Genesis chapter 9 and Genesis chapter 10, and then there's an assault on it in Genesis chapter 11 with the Tower of Babel. When, when Noah came off of the ark with his boys, eight of them, and by the way, in the state of Illinois, probably in your state, you can have a group of up to 10 people congregate without having any, anybody frown at you. That's more than Noah had on the ark. He saved the world with eight people. So if you've got 10, you can be ahead of Noah by 20%, which is not a bad thing. Genesis chapter 9, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. Now that's exactly what he told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. So these boys, with their wives, are told, now he's wiped out everybody but Noah and his family, three, three sons and their, their wives. Now they are recommissioned in the earth with the same commission that Adam and Eve had to start with. So you literally, literally have a new beginning here. Verse number 2, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, and upon all the, that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, in your, into your hands are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. So now you can eat anything, any kind, any, anything that, that, that's alive, animals, you can have for food. Now, he told Eve, Adam and Eve they couldn't do that. They could only be vegetarians, vegans actually. Now you can add meat to your diet. You can be a carnivore. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. So just like I told Adam and Eve, you're just a vegetarian. Now you can have any kind of animal flesh. But the flesh of the life that thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of every man. And at the hand of every man's brother shall I require it. For whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For the image, in the image of God made he man. And you be ye fruitful and multiply and bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. And God spake unto Noah and his son saying, and, and then he goes on down with a promise and gives a pledge of it with the, the, the rainbow and so forth. When, when he, what he's doing here in the first part of this is he's adding the issue of what we call human government. You see on verse number 5, Surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand, if an animal or a man kills somebody, I'm going to require it because you're precious, you're made in my image. Verse 6, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Now what he's doing there is he's setting up a governmental structure. Up until this time, God had, he had established three institutions for man's operating in the earth. He gave him volition. We read that verse in Leviticus this morning about uh, a voluntary free will offering. Free will, volition, that's a Bible term. All the terms of theology that deny free will, you know, they call you all kind of names. 
Well, they don't have a Bible term for what they're saying. The Bible term is free will. God gave every individual that comes to rational thought, volition, the responsibility to make choices on your own. The next institution is marriage. Be, you're, you're to be married. Man, woman, one man, one woman, joined together. And then they're to be fruitful. That's family. So you start off with volition. You have choices that you make. Then you choose a mate and you have a marriage and the two become one flesh. And then they produce children. And that home is designed to take that little savage that just got born in the world and to civilize him and in, 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 in give him traditions and give him understanding, teach him God's word, teach him the truth of God, bring him into understanding of how to function in life. And those three institutions are there. And what they do, when, by the time you come to the flood, they've demonstrated that they're not adequate. That patriarchal system isn't adequate for the orderly maintenance of multitudes, be fruitful and replenish the earth. Someone said, we're talking about socialism. Socialism is a system that will work within a family. But when you get beyond a family, it won't work. If I go over here, it happens at my house all the time. My wife will go and buy a pizza, bring it home, and invite our grandchildren to come and consume it. And they do. Now, they didn't work for it. They didn't buy it. She worked for it. She took her money and she bought it. She gave it to them because she wanted That's basically what socialism does. Is it, it provides the... Uh, uh, you, I, I was raised, my dad used to say, if there's, if you, if there's food in the refrigerator, you can eat it. <laughs> it's the, it, the, it belongs to the family. Now, he made the money... But the family, it belongs to the family. Now, that's fine, but when, when, when you begin to extend that to your next-door neighbor, to the guy down the street, somebody, well, that's, that's a, it doesn't work then. So the idea of the family unit is one, but when it begins to be more families and more families and more families and more, you need a different structure. And what happened in the flood is that every man did that which is evil. That, that was right in his own eyes. Every thought of his heart, imagination, is only evil continually. And it turned out so that the, the earth is filled with violence. Chapter 8, verse 21, the Lord smelled a, a sweet savor, and, and the Lord said in his heart, I, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore everything uh, that is living as I, as I have done. God destroyed man and the earth because of the violence that was in the earth, the destructive violence. Revelation in Romans chapter 13. Uh, it's fascinating how people use this passage and don't, don't pay attention to what it actually says. Romans 13, where Paul talks about this. Let every soul be subject to higher power. This is a soul issue. This is not a government issue. This is not an outward structure issue. This is something you need to have in your conscience, in your inner man to understand how this works. For there's no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. God set up government. Whoso therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. You see, I didn't say they're not a, he's not a terror to good works, but to evil. There is a specific evil that human government was established to restrain and to hold back and to stop and to protect people from. And that evil was chaos. It was the, the destructive chaos brought into the earth because of sin, the violence and, and chaos. So after the flood in order to have the orderly maintenance of, of, of the function of man and the earth. In Genesis 9, God, when he puts Adam and Eve there, I'm sorry about Noah and his families there, he adds not just volition, not just marriage, not just be fruitful and multiply and replace, but he adds a structure of government. Now, if I say to you, if someone kills someone, 
you have the right through legal means to institute capital punishment. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth in, in the terminology of Deuteronomy 11. I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 19. Now, that's not an individual. You go read in Deuteronomy when he says that. That's the sentence, sentencing guidelines for a court. That's not, well, you know, it's not some, you know, jack leg preacher on a horseback in some western said, I'm going to go get revenge. Revenge is just mine. I, I, saith the Lord, I will repay. You don't go get vengeance personally. But the government, the government, a duly constituted government with a court that hears the evidence and finds someone guilty, the standard of punishment is equality. An eye for an eye. You don't, somebody takes somebody's eye out, you don't cut their toe off. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for life. Now, what is the highest thing you can take from somebody? Not a tooth, not an eye, but their life. So if you can take the highest thing, well, then you could take everything from the bottom up to that. So you start at the bottom and work up as high as the standard lets you go. And so what we're talking about is human government. And that's the fourth institution. I understand that in the common, ordinary dispensational system, Schofield, Larkin, that kind of stuff, that human government is considered a dispensation. But the Apostle Paul doesn't think that way. Paul doesn't say there's, there's innocence and then there's conscience and then there's human government and then there's pro. He doesn't talk like that. And for me, personally, personal, private, individual approach, it's, it's more satisfying for me to use Bible terms than it, is to, than it is to place that, superimpose a structure onto the Scripture. Paul talks about from Adam to Moses. Then he talks about from Moses to Christ. Then he talks about Paul. Then he talks about the kingdom. So those are the kind of dispensational settings in the Scripture. From Adam to Moses, Paul calls that something. He calls that promise. In Matthew 25, when Jesus talks to the people that are going to go into the kingdom, he says, Come, you blessed of my Father, you who are going to inherit the Abrahamic promise. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So that millennial kingdom is something that God had been promising and preparing for some people from the foundation of the world, from the time he put man on the earth. That's why that issue back there of promise, the promise of a redeemer, the promise of a seed of the woman becomes the seed of Abraham, becomes the seed of David. That's why that thing back there is called the promise. So I'd call that the dispensation of promise from Adam onward. Added to that is the law, Galatians 3. The law doesn't do away with the dispensation of promise. It just adds the law to it so that everybody could see that the promise isn't going to be won through your works and your goodness because you're a sinner and need a redeemer. You can have a, have a redeemer to do that. So to me, and I know somebody says, well, but isn't innocence you know, before the garden, isn't that a dispensation? Oh, okay, you got me there. I'll say that's fine. Uh, you can call that a dispensation if, if you care to. And then you'd have the dispensation of promise, that'd be two, law would be three, grace would be four, kingdom would be five. So I guess you've got five, six, you know, dispensation of fullness. So you can, you can get up to seven if you want to. <laughs> Some people fixate on that seven, you know. But my point back here is we're under the promise that God made to Adam, the seed of the woman. And that seed line is narrowed down. Now it's back to the seed of Noah because everybody else has been wiped out. And I know it's three boys. And so when you come out of that, out of the flood, reestablishing man in the earth, reorganizing man to operate in the earth in a new way, you add, you add to volition, you add to marriage, you add to family, you add the issue of nationalism, human government, that turns out to be, in chapter 10, when these boys go out into the, war, into the earth, now there are, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and under them were sons born after the flood. And then he gives you the genealogies. 
verse 2, the sons of Japheth. They're going to go out, verse 6, the sons of Ham. Then you come on down, and it'll be the sons of Seth. And you have who, they, who their boys are, who their grandkids are, where they go, and how they organize themselves. If you come down to verse 30, 32, these are the families of the sons of Noah, after the generations and their nations. By these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So here's how the nations of the earth are divided up. You notice in verse 31, these are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, in their land, after their nations. And if you go down through that passage, he says what he says in verse 31, he'll say that after each one of these Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And in essence, what he does, he defines a nation by three criteria, borders, language, and culture. You have to have a land, an identifiable piece of real estate where a group of people that speak the same language gather together and produce a culture. So you have borders, languages, and cultures. It takes time to do that. And over time, as man scattered in the earth and are divided up into national entities borders, by borders, language, and culture. So in, by the time you come to the end of Genesis 10, you've seen that spread out. Now, by the way, Genesis 10 brings you up to, to, uh, to Shem. Verse chapter, chapter 11, verse 10, begins with, 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 uh, with Shem's ancestry again and takes you to Abraham. So just like in Genesis 5, you go from Adam to Noah, in Genesis 10 and 11, you go from Noah to Abraham. And Abraham, is the, you're, cha you're, you're tracing that, that seed of the woman through these things to get to Abraham. So this is a seminal part of Scripture in these issues. Now there are, when you read chapter 10 and 11, there are several incidences. I, I, I don't know exactly how to say it any other. There, there, there's some episodes that kind of interrupt the flow of thought. The first one's in chapter 10, verse 8. Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be, now Cush is, is the son, verse 6, the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim. So Cush is the son of Ham. Nimrod is the son of Cush. So Nimrod is the grandson of Ham. He'd be the great-grandson of Noah. So you're in the lineage here. Verse number 8, Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Now when you read about that being a mighty one in the earth, there were some mighty ones before the flood. Look back at chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse number 4. And there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, in other words, after the flood, like when Nimrod was there. When the sons of God came in under the daughters of men, and they bare them children, they bare children to them, and the same became men, mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Well, Nimrod becomes a mighty one in the earth. In other words, there's a there, there, there's a connection that goes back, and you say, hmm, this is going to be an interesting guy. Verse number 9, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kep this guy begins, you look at verse 11, out of, the land, out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh. So out of, Nim, out of Nimrod's life and influence, there were two great empires that affect the rest of your Bible. One is Asher, Assyria rather. That's where the capital of Assyria is Nineveh. And the other is Babylon, Babel. 
Nimrod established power centers in the earth, a kingdom. He became a kingdom builder. Now, that reminds you of Genesis 4. Cain, God told Cain what? Because you've killed your brother, you're going to be a vagabond. You can't have any certain dwelling place. What did Cain do? He went out and built a city. So he would have a certain dwelling place and not be wandering in the earth like God. He, he built that city in total, complete rebellion against God's will and punishment in his life. When he built that city, he wasn't building it to honor God. He was building in rebellion against what God had said his punishment was going to be. Nim, none of them. Nimrod. God said to Noah, your descendants now can eat animal flesh. I'm going to put the fear of animals in you so that they won't just walk up, you knock them in the head and eat them. If you're going to kill Bambi, you're going to have to chase her down. They're not just going to jump in your boat. You're going to have to fish her. I'm going to put, I'm going to put that fear in you. Now, why would he do that? Well, he told them, I want you to go scatter in the earth and replenish the earth. And if they have to forage for food, that enhances their desire to be nomadic, to go out and scatter. So it was an enhancement for, uh, to motivate them to scatter. Nimrod says, look, you sit down here. You don't need to go scatter. By the way, you remember in Genesis 4 how they built the city? Then they built, they built leisure time and they built culture and you got artifacts going on, you got manufacturing, and you've got a whole society built in the end of Genesis 4. Where they're not scattering, they're right, they're, 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 you build a metallurgical factory, you've got a place you've got to build. You've got to build a kill, you've got to be in one place. Nimrod's going to do that. Nimrod is a rebel against what God's plan is. And he develops a way... He says, look, it's easier for you to go down to Jewel or Osco or Sam's and pick meat out of the meat market than it is you have to go out and spend a week hunting. Have you ever tried to hunt and find, go, go hunt for a week and get nothing? We've got brother, guys around here that like to deer hunt. And you know, if one of them kills a deer, it's an exciting thing for the whole congregation. <laughs> They'll have... Hour, I mean, tens of dozens of hours and get one deer. Now, if you were dependent on living on that and eating that, your family eating it, that'd be kind of depressing, you know. He says, I'll tell you what, I'll go hunt. I figured this out. And he, would, he developed a system where he would go out and hunt, provide for people you stay here, you build the city, you live here, and I will provide. And he, built, he, he literally builds a kingdom doing that. And he builds a power base. And so he's, he's exploiting um, the, 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 uh, the world in rebellion against what God's doing, and he builds the kingdom. Now, while he's doing what's going on there in verse 8, 9, and 10, where the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, come down to chapter 11 because here in chapter 11 is what's going on back there in verse 9 and 10 of chapter 10. Chapter 11, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Now, now notice how chapter 1 verse 1, if you go down to chapter 1 verse 10, and these are the generations of Shem. See how he goes back to the genealogy in verse 10? So what you have in verse 1 through verse uh, 9 there is another one of these little episodes where he's describing actions that are taking place. And it's sort of a flashback to the days of Nimrod. The whole earth was of one language and one speech. There's your new world order. There's the one world government, one world language, and it's going to be a one-world religion and a one-world economy. The whole earth was of one language and one speech. That is, you get everybody together. 
it's not really hard to get people together when they all speak the same language. Now, they might not all like avocado. Somebody might like oranges, and somebody like, might like catfish. But if they all, speak, they all speak the same language, they can share that, and it becomes a good thing. So there's one language, one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. Now you've got Nimrod and his crowd. And by the way, they are, they are going to encroach upon Shem's territory when they do this. And they said unto one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city. Now that isn't what they were supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be scattering. They're going to be like Cain. And a tower. A tower is a high tower. Over and over, Psalms talk about God, your, the Lord is my high tower. You ever seen a church building with a steeple on the top of it? That's what this is. They don't only have a one world political system. They're going to have a one world religious system that is a system of rebellion against the God of the Bible whose top, now here's how you know it, whose top may reach unto heaven. In other words, here's a building, and we're going to have a, some stuff going on the top up there that's going to get us to heaven. That's not like the old cartoons where you know, they're just trying to, like Jack and the Beanstalk, build a tower up there. On the top of that tower... They were going to do some things, some oblations, that were going to get them in, con in, in contact with the host of heaven. Now, think about all you know about pagans. Think about what you know about the, the false gods of the Bible. They worship the host of heaven. And who are the host of heaven? Well, that's the stars, the nebula, and that kind of stuff. But more than that, it's the angelic host, the, false, the fallen gods. And they're trying to get in touch with these fallen gods. We're talking about idolatry. All the, all the gods of the, uh, of the heathen are, are, are idols. They're physical representations of these spiritual forces, and we're trying to get in touch with the spiritual world through physical things. That's what idolatry is all about. And let us make us a name. Now here it is, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of of the whole earth. We want to do this lest we do what God commissioned us to do. Now they're going to do it out of man-made stuff. They don't go take stone that God made. They go make their own brick. We're going to do this on our own. They don't like to retain God in their knowledge. We don't want God's instruction. They become vain in their imaginations and their foolish hearts darken. Professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. And they change the glory of the Creator into an image made like unto man. And there you have it. And that's what, actually, that's what Romans chapter 1 is talking about. Is what's going on right here. If you ever wondered how the heathen got that way, Romans 1 tells you. And it's an exposition of what's, what you're reading about right here. Now, the satanic counter to nationalism is internationalism, is globalism. The one world religion that leads people into having a mindset that will do politically, socially, and economically the thing that God says that isn't how the world nations are, fun are going to function. You need to have a national entity that is not homogenized, one world, but that is separated into borders, language, and culture. And if you study history, you study how nations form and how nations operate, you'll find out that borders actually are one of the most 
powerful things to produce the culture of a people. If you take a country that has no, it's landlocked, has no borders on any water, any ocean, it will have an entirely different culture developed because of that than a country like America. The United States of America is one of the only countries in the world, one of the few countries, who have thousand plus miles of coastline on the two great oceans, the Atlantic and the Pacific. We are a geopolitical marvel as far as a nation is concerned. And we have warm water ports all year long on both of the great oceans. And they're, what, 1,500, 1,800 miles long. That makes our country a different kind of a country than a country like Chile, for example, who has a long history, a long coastline, but they don't go in very far because of the mountains. Or you take a country like a European country that's landlocked. Uh, my point is that borders make a lot of difference about the culture that, uh, that, that people develop. And language is the thing that causes people to isolate in those places. Because you see what happens. God's judge, God didn't have to break a sweat in order to judge mankind. Verse number 5. The Lord came down to, the city and the t to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people are one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Notice it's their vein and their imagination. This is all that stuff in Romans 1. They become vain, professing themselves to be wise, they become fools, and so on and so forth. So what's God going to do? Well, he says, Let us go down. And there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So, the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon all the face of the earth. So what did he do? He confounded their language. Now they can't talk to each other. Well, when you're in a group of people and you can't speak to them and you find somebody across the room over there that, can, that you can understand, who are you going to go stand by? Who are you going to eat supper with? with? Who are you going to go home with? You're going to begin to congregate based on the, the ability to communicate the languages together. What gathered people together and what separated them was the language, the way, the, God, the way God divided up the nations in the earth. By the way, it wasn't racial divisions. It was language divisions. Come with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul. Paul says some things about this because Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. If you're going to understand how to minister to Gentiles, then you need to go to the apostle Paul, who is the apostle of the Gentiles, and let him tell you how the nations are designed to operate. Here's the passage where he does that. Acts, 20, Acts 17, verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and has made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. So all the nations of the earth share equally in the humanity that God created when he created Adam. So it's not a racial thing. Because we all share the identity as the human race. Okay, We all share one, of one blood of Adam. He made everybody. 
and hath determined the times before appointed, and watch, the bounds of their habitation. The boundaries. What, how do you identify a nation? Borders. Boundaries. Language. Culture. The culture comes because you live in these borders. What gathers you into those borders is you all speak the same language. So he gathered these nations together because they spoke the same language then they would seek a border, a territory that they lived in, and then they would live in that territory and develop a culture. They would multiply and replenish that culture. So he does that. Why did he do that? Verse 27, that they should seek the Lord. He, he put them in those bounds, in those borders of their habitations. He put them in the borders, language, and culture that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. The purpose for doing that was evangelism. <laughs> In Genesis 11, the purpose for not having it, having one language, was globalism. But the globalism was based upon lest we would do what God said. It's based on total rebellion against God. So God says, I'll set you up in nations, put a border around you, gather you together with your language, you'll develop a culture, and I'll set up a government that will protect you. And if, the, if someone in a, across the other border over there does something, you can be protected because you've got borders and a protection, a protection barrier. So it's for your protection. So that what? So that you can discover what it is to have me as, a, as your God as opposed to the false gods. So he structured nationalism. Now the issue of internationalism, that is the satanic attempt to destroy what God set up, how he destroyed mankind to function. He never, God never established the earth for man on his own to go out there and have one world global internationalism. Everything functions. And by the way, in the ministry of the church, the body of Christ, the way the body of Christ is designed to operate and function is through the primary vehicle is a local church. You have this universal body but it's designed to function through a local manifestation of that body. That's why the local church is the primary vehicle for the operating of the work of the ministry. That's why when you have, in religion what I call cooperative programs, we're going to get a bunch of churches together, and we're going to set up a hierarchy up here, and we're going to go the cooperative program, for example, the Southern Baptist Convention, we're going to do all, all of your, turn all your mission work over to us. You just send us the money and we'll go do it. And they've turned themselves into a, a woke social warrior group through their ethics uh, and, and, and life commission, and local churches have no control over it. A bunch of, the liberals took over. The Genesis 11 crowd took over. In Evangelical fundamental circles. How do you do missions? You set up a mission board. And that mission board goes out here to all these local churches and tries to pick, take 50 bucks here, 50 bucks there, and support a missionary. And he's got, you know, he's got 100 mission people supporting him, 50 bucks a month. Now he's got 5,000 bucks. He can go to the mission field. Well, where's his accountability? It's that mission board, not the local church. Local church really has no, no, no say about that, really. $50 doesn't make a lot of difference to 5000 You set up training schools, seminaries, and Bible colleges, and Bible institutes. What happens? You set them up out there, and they become their graduate's alma mater. When the graduate has something, need, needs, a new, needs to go to a new church, needs some a question, where does he go? He doesn't go to the church that raised him up, where he got saved, who raised him up, got him in the ministry. He goes to, you see, all of a sudden you've got the, it, it's a global structure that, that way. What God does is he breaks it down. And I've, ha I've had mission directors tell me, it's just too inefficient. But that's the way God designed it. So it must not be really inefficient. 
I remember Newt Gingrich years ago when he was the Speaker of the House of Representatives. I watched him on C-SPAN one time. He was explaining that the House of Representatives is the most inefficient legislative body in the world. And it's designed to be that way. <laughs> so they just couldn't go pass a bunch of laws, make it hard, slow, cumbersome. So it takes some time and effort, and thus you've got to get grassroots support to do it. And I thought, well, that's, that's, the founders were pretty smart about that. Now, the politicians that are there have, have screwed the thing up so bad that they're, they're just figureheads. But the point is that when he established the nation, listen, that was God's method of protecting the citizens, the people in it, and making it more likely than otherwise for them to hear the truth, if happily they might seek after me and find me. They're stumbling around in the dark looking for something they don't even know what, but they got a better chance of hearing truth in that circumstance than in, in, in the globalism. The larger, here's the truth, the larger the group of people you preach to, the less you can say. Because you have to, in the bigger group, you have to constantly be speaking to the lower common denominators and not over people's heads. So anyway, what you have in internationalism, what you have in globalism, is the satanic policy of evil against the institution of nationalism. The idea that Trump says, America first. That doesn't mean other people don't count. It means, it's the same thing if you say, I'm going to pay my bills first, feed my family first. Paul said, if a man doesn't take care of his family, he's worse than infidels else denied the faith. That doesn't mean you can't take care of other people. It just means you take care of your responsibilities first. And you do that right. You know, that way you know what they are, what the real needs are, and you deal with them correctly. So is there a new world order coming? Yes, it'll be the Antichrist. Ultimately, it'll be Jesus Christ when he sets up his kingdom. It isn't going to happen. What's going on right now is not going to work out and to be the new. It's a... Stage setting, dress rehearsal, getting the culture ready. Can it be reversed? Not a chance. Our, our society's gone way too far. I know there are people that hang on. They say, well, we believe that we can turn it around and so forth. And, you know, I, I wish you luck. But I understand how th it takes four generations to change a culture. Our culture that we live in today, the last Great Awakening, there have been four in American history. The last Great Awakening took place in the 60s. It was the first and only Great Awakening in American history that's taken place that wasn't Bible-based in some way. It was New Age-based. Takes four generations to change a culture, so here we are. If the foundations are destroyed, what should the righteous do? That's the reason you see our culture splitting up into tribalism, into small groups, and that, but, but folks, that's the way it's been for 2,000 years. The American experiment was the wonderfully ripe fruit, socially and economically, of the Protestant Reformation. The principles by which it operated has to be inculcated into people. And you have people under 30 today, under 35, that don't know what they are. You can't tell them they don't know because they know everything there is to know. What 30-year-old doesn't? But what they know is what they need to know, biblically. Now, it's a wonderful day. Listen, when everybody's going around with like, like chickens with their heads cut off, it's a wonderful day to have your head screwed on right. You can be a leader. You can be a contributor. You can take truth and make it known. This pandemic that's going on now is demonstrating without any question that the culture we, have, we live in today has no legitimate answer to the questions of people. They have no legitimate hope. The fear, the hysteria, the terror that grips people comes from 
fearing the loss of this mortal life, losing things that you possess, and they have no answer for it. You have an answer. Now, you don't need to go smack somebody upside the head. You need to go out there, speak the truth in love, but you need to be out there with the truth, pointing people, letting them see what real peace and tranquility in the midst of all this trouble really looks like. Not pointing hysterically at this, that, and the other reason for it, but pointing at the answer. Because no matter what the reason, the answer is the key. And the answer is not some temporal solution, the answer is an eternal solution. There will be plenty of people that will fight the other battles. You need to fight that one. This pandemic is showing, I said this morning, it's demonstrating that the charismatic Pentecostal crowd and all of the evangelical fellow travelers that, that try to hang on to them are nothing but useless frauds. They can't, they can't, they, they claim to get messages from God. They can't predict the future. Not a one of them predicted this was going to happen. None of them. The one dude is on the, on the radio and TV and, the, and, 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 and stuff that, that's so popular as a prophecy preacher, he had a prophecy conference scheduled in March that he had to cancel. Wouldn't you think if God was giving him words of prophecy, he'd have told him? The pandemic's coming. Don't schedule that conference. <laughs> we had to cancel our summer conference. The hotel we were going to meet in went closed up. We don't have a word of prophecy. We cancel it when we found out the arrangements required us to. But I don't tell you I get God speaking to me, giving me words of prophecy. He does. You know what he is? He's a fraud. He's a dangerous fraud. You have these guys claiming COVID virus be gone. <laughs> America's cured. How'd that work? It didn't. None of them going down to the hospital, curing people, healing people. They always got their little outs. Well, that's not my lane, brother. Well, then quit saying it is. All that stuff. Those people are making more atheists than the atheists make. But people want to know, where is God? What is God doing? Why is this verse in the Bible doesn't work? Why is my loved one losing their job, taking 25% you know, uh, salary reduction? And, and, and I, why, why, why is it I can't pay my rent and buy groceries this month because of what's going on? Doesn't God care? You've got answers. Don't get sidetracked in things of lesser value eternally. Praise the Lord. It's wonderful to know God's grace. It's wonderful to know the truth out of His Word. And it's wonderful to know that the body of Christ was formed, created, and designed for times like this. You and I have lived off the fat of the land for so long, we think the body of Christ is designed just to make sure that we have a happy, sweet, prosperous, fat life. Alex was mentioning uh, Jackson having the, in the hospital with the, with the uh, various problems. They'd lost 10 pounds. You know what the COVID-19 is. You gain 19 pounds while you got COVID. <laughs> well, I've got COVID-10. So we're used to that. And we get all excited and frightened when a little of you, listen, none of that can separate you from what's real. Godless with contentment is great gain. Paul said, I have learned therewith to be content. Let the truth of God be the thing that you trust, that instructs you, that teaches you. And you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Let's be about being who we are. Father, we thank you tonight for your love and your grace. And I just pray that we would be able to function as intelligized saints.
Not walk in darkness, but walk in light. And we're able to share that light with others. In Christ's name, we give you the thanks. Amen.